When I arrived at Adams State College, I found out that it was a different world, even though it was only 50 miles apart in the town that I grew up in. I found out that uh, people don't accept you um, because of who you are. They look at you differently because of uh, who you, where you come from, the color of your skin, uh, the accent in your voice. Uh, but those things are all things that have a major impact on how people are viewed. And to me, that was repulsive. It was um, ignorant. Um, it, was un it was totally unimaginable to me that that was uh, something that could occur. So very quickly, um, I became friends with a lot of people that have experienced that. And I started seeing that even um, on this campus. Well, you know, the experience in college was um, very interesting to me. Of course, I came from a small town. Uh, the town of San Luis was probably, at the time that I was there, um, at its peak really, at maybe, maybe 1,500, 12, 1,500 people in the entire town. So it was kind of a very close community and I didn't, I was sheltered from a lot of things. Um, the reality is that um, what was happening in the broader world uh, with the civil rights movement, with all the things that were happening, uh, you know, in D.C. and uh, um, in the South, uh, the Vietnam War, all those things we were insulated from that. I'd watch them on television, but to me they were a world away and uh, never really had um, a clear understanding of that. Um, what was also interesting is that in our community, uh, Hispanics were all leaders. Uh, my grandfather was a superintendent of schools. Uh, my two uncles were both uh, uh, clerk and recorders. Uh, my dad was a county commissioner. Um, we, my uncle was the uh, uh, principal of the school. I went to school with my aunt. Uh, two of my aunts were my, my teachers. Uh, so to me, I didn't understand that um, there was racism and uh, discrimination and oppression of, uh, of people um, because we lived in this close community. And I could not fathom that uh, somebody would discriminate against me because of who I am. Well, that's an interesting question. How did I feel of being a Chicano while I attended Adams State College? Um, quite frankly, Coming from San Luis, uh, you have to understand that San Luis is predominantly Chicano. So when I came to Adam State, it uh, was really the first time I really encountered going to, to school with other students other than Chicano, for the most part. Uh, and so there was quite a diversity for, for me. You have to understand that in the 60s and early 70s, there was quite a bit of unrest uh, across the country at different campuses uh, having to do with racial tensions, with uh, unfairness amongst cultures on different campuses. Otherwise, why was there so much unrest and in some cases some real violence that was taking place in, on some campuses? We began organizing students. Um, we, a bunch of us guys from San Luis became members course and got to know people from Monta Vista and from Center, from uh, towns all around northern New Mexico, uh, students that were here, and we began organizing. And uh, that really was the, uh, the, the uh, nexus of uh, putting together a, a very strong organization on campus. Um, we convinced the administration that we should need an office, and we had an office in what is now the Rex, used to be Rex Gym, a little office in the corner there, where we would meet um, daily. I mean, that office was always, always busy. We started organizing um, events um, in the community. Um, and at the same time that uh, UMAS, that I became president of UMAS, the ALMA program was really taken off. And the ALMA program to me was one of the gems that this um, university has had. And it was the program that brought students in, helped us kind of make sure we could make it through, uh, through college. And uh, so the combination of um, the support that ALMA provided for the students and the student organization of UMAS was a very, very powerful source um, on, this, um, on this campus for, for many years, certainly for the years that I was here. We'd established the Chicano Studies Library here, but for whatever reason, um, the librarian and the institution decided to get rid of it. Uh, so they took the books out, a lot of them got thrown away. Um, a lot of the stuff got um, uh, kind of just made short shrift and, and tossed out. Uh, when we tried to address that, um, we didn't feel that the uh, administration gave us an adequate answer of why they had done that. So we organized a demonstration. And uh, as demonstrations go, you know, we pulled together all of the students. We had, I don't know, 
probably 100 students, 150 students, organized a uh, demonstration in front of the uh, ES building. And as the demonstration went into the student building, uh, we went in and um, the uh, uh, superintendents of all these schools um, across the uh, uh, valley were meeting on the third floor. And we went up there and we disrupted the meeting. And in the process, uh, we um, got security came in, they threw us out of the building. Um, there was a, you know, verbal confrontations, nobody got hurt. Uh, what was interesting is that my uncle was in that meeting, which uh, I heard about um, later, obviously, through my, uh, through my family. Um, but um, as things progressed, um, they, you know, we had had several um, uh, run-ins with uh, demonstrations that we were doing, and they picked out several of us that um, had organized the demonstration. Well, we took a lot of action. Now, as students, you're not as experienced as people that have gone through the system. As students, um, you tend to get to, from point A to point B very quickly. And right or wrong, you do take action. Sometimes it's not the best uh, route. But regardless, we, we did that as students because that's what we knew. And so, you know, we staged protests of different sorts. We had marches. We had uh, office takeovers, for instance, which was interesting. Maybe unfair to the administration, but we did it. Uh, we, we, at least a couple times, know that uh, we took over the president's office and we wanted their full attention and certainly we got it. Uh, was that the right way to do it? Probably not. But did we get the attention we wanted at the time? Yes, we did. Uh, we got our, our concerns heard because they really, they, the administration really had no choice. They had to listen to us and we took over their office. And you know they they took their the procedures they had to with by having kept security outside the office to make sure that things didn't get out of hand. Um, and so some students were much more forceful than others, as individuals are. As in any movement, being a Chicano movement, be it an art movement, be it any movement, you have you have uh, people that get involved at different levels. You have people that get involved at the very top that are the ones that are the uh, ones that are forging forward on the path to wherever you're going. You have others in the middle that support but don't want to be the leaders. And you have people at the very bottom that are trying to understand what's going on but still agree with some kind of movement and so they, they, they stay engaged. So we we had different things that we did on campus, right or wrong. We did them because that's how we knew how to do them as students. And we wanted attention, not because we had egos. We wanted attention as students to be heard as students. And we created situations where we were heard. Well, that was one of many issues that we addressed. I mean, uh, a lot of people focus on the fact that, you know, a lot of the blow up that we had on the campus was around the Chicano Studies. Uh, library that we had uh, here at, uh, at at this library where I'm sitting uh, right now. Uh, we had organized a number of different uh, uh, demonstrations um, around uh, all kinds of issues that um, we felt were uh, uh, needed to be addressed. But the Chicano Studies Library that we put in here, we felt that the institution was ignoring the literature that we were developing. And it wasn't only literature, it was art that was being ignored, it was a lot of things. But we focused on this case and trying to put together a section of the library that really brought in the books that were being written by us uh, that weren't here. And we thought that was an obvious um, exclusion. Um, we thought it was a racist and bigoted exclusion and that it needed to be, be addressed. And we got the uh, university uh, to put in a section of the library, it was the Chicano Studies Library. Um, a room that was held out on the, uh, I think it was even on the third floor, as I remember, in the uh, um, uh, northwest corner, uh, north northwest corner of uh, of the library. Uh, we felt that we weren't that our literature wasn't being adequately represented in 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 the institution. But like I said, neither was our art, uh, neither was our culture, 
neither were a lot of things that we felt needed to be brought in. And that was the focus of UMAS, is to bring in our literature, bring in our culture, make it part of the mainstream, bring in our um, art, you know, the, uh, the, the art exhibits that we would do. That was the idea, that we were going to transform this institution and wake it up and make it understand that really we do have a place in society, that the things that we contribute are important things. And as a result, we brought in Teatro Campesino, we brought in concerts, we brought in a lot of things. Uh, but the blow up over uh, the Chicano Studies Library is really what um, ended up getting me expelled from, uh, from the university. My name is Manuel Isaac Lopez. Uh, I'm an attorney. I uh, graduated from the University of Colorado School of Law in 1974 and uh, I was a practicing uh, attorney under the law school rules my uh, second and third year. Uh, I did one year of criminal work and one year of civil work. We uh, had a uh, law clinic at the University of Colorado School of Law then and we covered uh, Boulder County, and uh, and we did uh, one year of civil work and one year of criminal work. Uh, at the law school, I was also a member of the Chicano Law Students. But at the time, I li when I lived with my grandma, uh, you know, my mother wasn't in the picture. My uh, mother was dead, my birth mother. And my grandmother raised me for like three or four years. Uh, and that was quite an experience. The Aurora area, was, the whole area in Denver around there was, was quite an experience. Uh, uh, and that's when I started getting radical, really, was in the Aurora Barrio, because uh, the only time I saw police when there's when they came in to arrest somebody and drag them out of their house, literally drag them out of their house while they were beating them up and hitting them with nightsticks and stuff. And it was our people that they were doing that to. And I remember once when my dad came back, uh, they were getting his brother, my Uncle Ernie, they did that to him and I was there and I was old enough, I can't remember how old I was, to know what was going on. And uh, they they were doing the same thing, they were beating them up and uh, had them handcuffed and, you know, calling them an effing Mexican and they're usual. That's, that's the, they're, they were that way then and they still are, particularly in Denver. Uh, they're killers, and that's, I hate police, and that's why I hate them. Because that's the way they treated my people, and later on, that was the way they treated me. Okay? Um, and uh, me and mine. And I don't think it was ever that way down here. It, it was never that way. Okay? Um, but anyway, that particular day, uh, my dad said, to me, he pointed to the car, and he says, that says, uh, can you read that? And I couldn't. He says, that says to serve and protect. And he told me, it's not us that they're serving and protecting. What he said was, that ain't us. And uh, that was probably the first intellectual seed of me being part of the Chicano movement. Anyway, they got expelled. They came over to see our last, uh, and they were a wild bunch. Arnold, <laughs> Arnold was, <laughs> was really pissed off. They were all pissed off, but Arnold was really pissed off. And so uh, we said, "Well, I won't sound." We said, "Well, blank, let's sue their ass." And Keynote was the uh, office head. And it was, wasn't in our charter. We weren't supposed to do stuff like that. You know, we were getting federal money, and we had to be good boys and girls like you do over there, okay? You can't, uh, only we said, you know, take, <laughs> what are they going to do? What are they going to do? Okay? So I'm urging you to be a little more edgy with them. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, 
We said, hell yeah, let's do it, you know. Those were the Milagro Beanfield War days and and uh, we huddled up and uh, there was a guy on the board of directors, he's an Anglo guy from uh, Sawatch, who was the pre he was then the president of the board, George Wooder. He was a lawyer, a wonderful man, he was a liberal. And uh, he was all pissed off about it too. So we had support on the board of directors of Adam State, the trustees or whatever you want to call them. And he's in the same. He was in the same position that Arnold's in right now. And so he didn't care. He wanted us to do it. Uh, he couldn't go public, but you know we had a conference with him, and he laid it out where he was politically and what. Uh, so. We had uh, friends in high places. Uh, anyway, we sued uh, Adams State College in federal district court. Federal district court, okay? <laughs> Me and Ed, and we dragged those bastards all the way up there to Denver. You know, federal district courts right in the middle of downtown Denver. You know where it is, by the where the railroad is down at the north end, and. Uh, the hearing we had was we moved for a temporary injunction to enjoin the college from the expulsion. And that would keep them in school until we had a trial on the merits, right? It would be, what, a year or two years down the road. So if you lose, that was it, right? That hearing was it. Because if we lost, it was over. They were expelled. Um, had testimony all day long. It was a long, hard day. They had a lot of witnesses, all the idiots from Adam State, uh, you know, testifying what bad boys we were, bad boys and girls you guys were. Uh, I wasn't in Umas there, but they were all bad boys and girls. Boy, you and you needed to be spanked. That's basically what it was. Okay, you did this, and so and so did this, and. Basically, it was, mar uh, you know, marching in front of the president's building uh, with uh, uh, We Want a Library, We Want a Chicano, uh, you know, that. And for other things, you know, other things, we, uh, uh, just stating your demands, that's, isn't that what free speech is all about? That's what free speech is all about. And that's one of our most sacred parts of the Constitution is we have our First Amendment. We have our First Amendment right to free speech. And they, should, they were exercised, and that was our defense, right? It's real simple. They were exercising their First Amendment right to free speech, and you are kicking them off the college. You are kicking them out. Uh, and yeah, we had piles of paper, but that's what it boiled down to. And uh, when you have the truth on your side, it's cool. <laughs> you don't need all those little nicks and bends in the road. You know, that's, that's what it is. We have a right to free speech. And even the poorest vato, you know, over there on the south side here has a right to free speech. They don't know how to exercise it, but they have it. Um, and we got to teach those people. We got to get them up, even if they can't go to Adam State and graduate. Uh, you guys ought to be sharing your. If we could get them off the Oxycontin and heroin. So uh, we went, uh, had an all day battle, uh, basically cross examining. Uh, the college witnesses, and they had a whole bunch of them, like I said, and then we got to our, you know, uh, they rested, and uh, we put Arnold on, I can't remember who else we put on, and uh, uh, once we established that factual basis, which was what they were doing, right, and what they were doing was free speech protected by the United States and Colorado constitutions, that's all they were doing. And that's the point we were making with our witnesses that they were doing a, a legal uh, First Amendment protected demonstration. 
And the judge caught on to that really quick. It was so crystal clear. He just uh, hit his bench and he says, I want to see all of you back in the uh, in chambers. And then he looked at the Davis Graham and Stubb lawyers and he says, you're not going to like what I have to say. Uh, we went back in chambers, uh, got everything set up, the court reporter sets up his machine and everything's okay, we're ready to rock and roll. And he just, like somebody said, action, you know, like on a movie. <laughs> it was just like that. And he just uh, started railing at him and pointing his finger and yelling. And he says, I want this case dismissed now because you're not going to like what happens if you go to trial. And uh, they huddled. The, the opposing lawyers uh, said, well, could we uh, have a short break? And they went back and they huddled up. I don't know if they called anybody. There was all those guys from Adam State, so they must have huddled up in the main courtroom <clears throat> and told them uh, we're going to lose, you know, told them the facts of life. They came back in and said, uh, we're dismissing this suit. So, uh, judge dismissed. They just said dismissing. Uh, and we wanted with prejudice in there, okay? Because if you just dismiss without prejudice, you can refile the lawsuit. Um. It was very interesting, the timing of it, because it was in, in uh, the early part of December, something like that, mid-December. And so I went to the meeting, they asked me numerous questions I had to answer. Uh, they had pictures of us for different events and asking me questions such as, is this you in this picture? Well, of course it was, how could I deny it? <laughs> I, was, I was involved. And so, after the meeting with the College Standards Board for my personal meeting, um, I asked them if I was still going to be an Adam State College student. And they told me at that time that they'd have to, they were going to talk to the rest of the people that they were going to be interrogating. And then they make a decision. I told them, well, if you can't make a decision right now, I'm going to Mexico under the auspices of Adam State to go study. And if I get no notice, I'm a student of Adam State in Mexico. And so I, I left because they didn't make a, a decision. And so when I was in, in school in Mexico, under the auspices of Adam State, I did get a letter from a friend saying that another demonstration had been held because of all the students that had to undergo these interrogations with the College Standards Board, and that myself, I was reinstated, and I believe that others were not. And so it was unfortunate for the others that were not, because uh, quite frankly, uh, I don't think it was, I don't know that it was due process, it probably was to the best of their ability, I don't know. Uh, but some of the students that never went back to school, I still see some of those students, some of those people today and they didn't finish their college degree. Well, admitting what we did is, of course, uh, Manuel was right on it. And, um, of course, we filed a lawsuit on the uh, uh, um, university for a violation of the First Amendment uh, rights. And actually, uh, Manuel, um, John Keenholt, who later became a, uh, a district judge, um, Ed Lovato, who's still in private practice, were the attorneys that uh, defended us. And they did this uh, free. They didn't cost us a dime. These guys gave her their time and their effort to um, get us back into school. It was me and uh, and uh, um, four other uh, students, four other women students that uh, that got expelled. Um, they filed the case in federal district court, um, and uh, we had several hearings. I spent a lot of time in Denver uh, trying to deal with the whole idea of how we were going to get back into uh, into school. And, it, and so these guys did uh, beautiful legal work. I mean, they had lawyers from Denver helping us. It was a, uh, a time when uh, people were willing to, people were willing to look beyond their own, their own personal needs to try to help somebody else. And these guys really, really helped us. We brought in, uh, they brought in lawyers from Denver that were just brilliant people uh, helping us through federal courts. Got us into federal court, did a hearing in federal court. And uh, what happened was that the uh, judge essentially said, uh, to the school, 
if I were you, I would um, try to settle this and not take it any further. And in legal terms, and I don't know if Manuel told you this, that basically says if you move, move this any further, you're going to lose. So be careful what you do here. Uh, so that was a major victory for us. At the same time that this was going on, um, we organized, I didn't organize because I was not in school anymore. Um, they organized a demonstration in front of the uh, Richardson Hall. And that demonstration was to demonstrate against the fact that five of the students had been expelled for the, dem for the uh, uh, protest that we had done. And uh, I watched the demonstration from the uh, from the very top of Richardson Hall. They snuck me in the back and I was watching it from the top. And as I looked down, there's a picture in the uh, uh, South Colorado one that I still have. And it's a picture of my wife and her brother and several, I mean, all the people that I could recognize in this picture that were demonstrating uh, against the fact that they had thrown us out of school. Uh, I got the paper later um, on in the week when it was published to look at the picture. And when I opened it up, on one side was the picture of the demonstration. And on the other side was a picture of uh, Ruben Valdez. I don't know if you know who Ruben Valdez is. He was the first speaker, the first Hispanic uh, to be elected speaker of the House of uh, Representatives in Colorado. And Ruben to this day is still a very good friend of mine. Um, what ended up happening is I was read through the article I looked at and there was an article about Ruben saying, here's this guy who's the first speaker, uh, Hispanic uh, speaker of the House. And I told the other uh, students that had gotten expelled with me, let's go talk to him. So we got in the car and went to Denver. Didn't have an appointment, nothing. Walked into the state capitol, and if you've ever been to the state capitol, the office of the Speaker of the House is a really pretty office. You walk into an office, it's big, it's all wood, it's just a beautiful office, and sitting there was a secretary. And we walked in, and you know we were dressed like students. Uh, kind of how I'm dressed today, unfortunately. Uh, walked in and said, uh, she said, what, what do you want? And I said, well, we're here to talk to Ruben Valdez. We got expelled from school. And she says, do you have an appointment with him? And I said, no, we didn't know we were supposed to make appointments to, to talk to him. He says, you know, he's the Speaker of the House. He's a pretty busy guy. I said, yeah, we know, but we drove from Alamosa. Can we just speak to him for a little while? And the lady stood up and said, hang on just a minute. Let me go talk to see if he's in. And next thing I know, Ruben Valdez walks out and says, come into my office. We walked into Ruben's office, and he said, what are you guys here for? So we got expelled from school. He says, what were you guys doing? We explained what happened and all that kind of stuff. Um, he proceeded to um, uh, give us a tongue lashing of our life, uh, just like you would if your parents were sitting next to you. And he said, but uh, we're going to figure this out. He said, go talk to these four people. I want you to go talk to Polly Baca. I want you to go talk to Richard Castro. I want you to go talk to uh, uh, Paul Sandoval. Um, and uh, I went to talk to those, to those three people and we went to their offices and as we walked in, you know, Polly called us in, Polly Baca, and again proceeded to give us a tongue lashing for why the hell aren't you guys in school and you got to stay in school, whatever. I mean, you know, again, just a parent talk and said, go talk to uh, Rich Castro. And we went and talked to Rich Castro, the same thing. And then we went in and talked to Paul Sandoval. And Paul Sandoval was the uh, head of the Joint Budget Committee. And the Joint Budget Committee is the committee that actually appropriates funds for all of Colorado's uh, expenditures. We get, at this university, I think, I don't know, um, several million dollars from the Joint Budget Committee every year. So we really focus on, are we getting our portion of it? So he said, again, gave us a, a good talking to. He said, you guys leave and um, you'll be hearing more from me. So we left Denver not knowing what happened. What, what happened was that the four of them got together and Paul Sandoval called the president of the college, uh, Dr. Marvel, and told him, uh, basically, I don't know and I don't want to tell you how to run your institution, uh, but um, because, of course, that's your job, but uh, I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but if those students aren't back by the end of the next week into school, I'm going to cut your budget by a million dollars. So you let me what you let me know what you want to do. You either want to cut this budget by a million dollars. Uh, just tell me what you're going to do. Where you're going to let the students in. So that, in addition to the fact that the judge had already told the institutions that they better very seriously look at settling this, we were back in school within a matter of days. Completely established, complete uh, financial aid. Uh, they let us enroll in classes even though we were in the middle of class. Um, what they did is they let us back in and said, you know, these guys are going to flunk out anyway, so 
we'll let them back in the middle of the semester. They got to catch up. Uh, they're not going to be able to do it. Actually, we were on the quarter system, so a lot of time had already passed. Uh, so they let us back in, and it was absolute hell to catch up. We had to take all the classes that we had enrolled in. Um, some of the classes were full. They made exceptions and let us in. Um, and we were back in school again and uh, had to really, really struggle to, to, to make it through. But, you know, all of us made it uh, through that semester. And it was me. Um, and, and, of course, um, I've gone on to do um, uh, fun things in my life. One of the other ladies that got expelled with me ended up being a, a uh, high school principal uh, and was a principal in one of the schools here. Another lady that went, uh, got expelled with me uh, was a, uh, became an attorney, and she's an attorney in D.C. working for the, uh, veterans, uh, uh, for the uh, veterans Administration. And the third one uh, became a social worker and lived in Phoenix and did incredible stuff um, in the school system. So I think that one thing that makes a mistake is they think they expelled the four wrong students because these were people that, uh, um, all of us came from San Luis, by the way. Uh, me and the other, and of course, our resilience was uh, unshakable. Uh, and we were able to, to make it through. We got through just fine. And, and uh, No, there's one lady from Pueblo that got expelled with us, Patricia, who uh, also became a uh, very, very uh, successful uh, educator. Um, so the moral of the story is that um, I went back later. Um, Richard Castro ended up uh, dying probably 10 years after that. Um, and uh, recently, uh, within the last three, four years, uh, Paul Sandoval passed away. Uh, but before he passed away, I went back and talked to him and I asked him, you know, Paul, when we walked into your office, why did you do that? Why did you call the president and tell him, Either you let these students back in or I'm going to cut your budget by a million dollars. And he says, you know, one of the things I've learned, Arnold, in my life is that why bother getting political power if you're not going to use it? And to me, that is a life lesson. It doesn't make sense to work hard to get into positions of power if you're not going to use that power to help people. And, you know, those guys are, are heroes in my book. You know, they're very, very strong, strong people. And Ruben, to this day, is still a friend of mine. Uh, he's a lobbyist. Um, I meet with him several times a year, and uh, you know, to this day we laugh and talk about uh, me walking into his office when I was uh, 19 years old, uh, asking him to get get me back into uh, back into school. So, if you kind of fast forward a little bit, I guess um, what you see is then after graduating from Adams State, and I finished school in three years, even though I got expelled for one semester, and I graduated uh, cum laude um, with. Um, you know, pretty decent grades, and with that I was able to get into the uh, uh, University of Michigan, arguably probably one of the best universities in the country, and received a graduate degree from the University of Michigan, and um, immediately came back to the Valley, uh, because I felt that I had a lot of uh, unfinished business here. And so when I came back, uh, I became uh, director, of, or started working at the Mental Health Center, um, and eventually um, Got together with uh, uh, and became the director of the uh, mental health center. But you know, we did again what I had learned how to do when I was in um, in college. I began organizing. I put together a board of the mental health center of Manuel, uh, Judge uh, Martin Gonzalez was on my board, uh, Richard Herrera, several other people from the community, and we developed this organization that I currently uh, still work with. You know, so 20 years of uh, 25, well, 30 years of uh, investment into uh, this mental health. Uh, kind of organization that we've put together. In addition to that, I've also had a sideline of getting involved in politics. Um, one of them is that we, I was involved in several lawsuits against voter rights, and I was um, instrumental and very, very, very involved in the redrawing of House District 62 as a uh, uh, majority Hispanic district, and um, I was highly criticized for uh, my uh, taking a position on that. Um, I was an outlier. Um, I had people threaten my job, all kinds of stuff, but I didn't care because we won. We won in court, and now House District 62 is one of the uh, uh, districts in the state that is uh, Hispanic, majority Hispanic district, and it's a case that's been used across the country for uh, voting rights, and I have a real passion for voting rights. Uh, so in addition to just uh, my own life and working at the Mental Health Center, organizing it, doing what we've done, um, also have gotten um, highly involved in politics. And part of getting involved in politics is that I was recently uh, appointed as a trustee of the uh, uh, Adam State University. And uh, more importantly, and probably um, 
you know, kind of an interesting uh, side note is that I'm now the uh, chairman of the uh, Board of Trustees. So I'm probably the only um, chairman of any university in this country that got um, elected as the chair of the board who has uh, previously been expelled. Um, I guess I wear that as a badge of honor. It's not anything I'm ashamed of because um, when I left Adam State, um, I figured that my life was not going to be about finding a comfortable place for me, but it was going to be about making um, those people in power uncomfortable. And I've done that my entire career, um, is to afflict the, uh, uh, the comfortable um, and make the afflicted comfortable to help people that need help, but make those who are in power um, understand that there's other forces out there uh, that are important to listen to. So that's kind of the, the uh, sum total of um, what we've been able to do. I've been um, very pleased with uh, the career that I've had. Uh, I've got a great family. My wife is uh, involved in politics. Uh, we've been together for 38 years. Uh, she currently is the insurance commissioner for the state of Colorado, um, highly uh, uh, successful in her field. So um, I guess the other part that I talk about is the importance of holding the family close together um, is something that we brought out of uh, our existence in San Luis and how do you keep together as a family unit supporting each other. Those are the kinds of things that we try to bring into UMAS uh, that Alma tried to bring, didn't try, that they did bring in um, and that I'm hoping that all of you students who are here now can look at bringing that into uh, how you organize your uh, uh, you know, the CASA and all the other things that uh, are important to you. I want to stay in the San Luis Valley because I'm a native of the San Luis Valley. I don't want to leave. This is my home. This is where I want to be. And my education has allowed me to do that. So I find myself, quote unquote, successful being happy working here. I have my home here. I have my family here. It's a great place to live. Um, and actually, in retrospect, I really wouldn't change too much. I know I got myself in trouble, but would I do it again? If that's the way it had to happen, I would do it again. You know, the advice that I would um, give to students today is that um, one thing is don't live in the past. You can't do what I did. You can't do the things that, that we did. It was a different time, and it was for a different purpose and it was for a different strategy. That's not the point here. You don't need to organize those same demonstrations in the same way we did. Uh, what you need to do is live in the moment. Live in the moment, address those things that are in front of you. Uh, be strategic about how you think things through. Organize people and develop the kind of um, uh, respect and mutual understanding that's gonna help you uh, achieve the things that you need. Uh, make long-term commitments um, when I came back to the Valley, uh, I committed to, and my wife and I committed to being here long term and making a big, big change, that, uh, that as big a change as we could. And uh, don't veer from that. Uh, people will criticize you. Um, I've been villainized in every newspaper probably and, uh, you know, called names, and, but I don't care. Uh, I tell people, you know, I've got a really, really strong family. There's eight of us in our family. So I've got all the friends if I, that I need. You know, if I want a friend, um, and if I want love and admiration, I'll buy a dog. I don't need everybody to love me. I don't care about that. <laughs> you know, I, I'm fine with uh, being criticized. I'm fine, but I'm, I will not back off. And I think that's the thing you'll see in people like Manuel, uh, uh, who um, are principled people, who think that um, principle comes before anything else. And, uh, you know, those are the things that I would say to you guys, is that um, live in the moment, Look at those things that you need to do and make a lifelong commitment to what you're doing. This isn't just a, a, a passing thing. You know, this is a long, long-term commitment. And uh, what you've taken on here needs to be uh, something that will uh, last for generations. That would be my very um, respectful advice to uh, those of you who are uh, in the situation that we were in many, many years ago. My... Um my advice for future Chicano students at Adams State University is to keep everything in perspective, which means regardless of what you're doing, remember that you're in school to get educated, first and foremost. That doesn't mean that you do not get involved. Get involved. 
Much of the learning happens outside the classroom. Much of the learning happens uh, not reading the textbook. Much learning happens by your involvement on campus through clubs, through organizations, getting involved with civic affairs, learning, learning what life is about, learn how people treat each other, learn where the weaknesses are, learn how to strengthen them. So I would suggest that you go to class, do your homework, study, pass, but get involved with organizations on campus so you can get the other side of education. When they say a well-rounded education, that means the academia, but it also means the social. Learn how to work with people. Um, if you go to meetings, you may disagree, and you just agree to disagree, but learn how to work with people, how to talk to people so that you can get your point across, so that you can influence the other party so that you can get what you want and what you need. So keep it all in perspective.